Hello everyone, today we make a comparative analysis of Central European and Balkan uh, monarchies uh, in the late Middle Ages. It's a kind of video that I already did in the past comparing most of these kingdoms. T today we will essentially talk about Bohemia, Poland, Hungary and Serbia and addressing maybe something else like Lithuania, Wallachia, Moldavia, Bulgaria, etc. And uh, it's one of those topics I uh, address um, in for this comparative sake, specifically, uh, awaiting, and this will probably happen soon, for getting a bit more in-depth in the history of, of such countries. There is already something more in-depth, right, for some of these countries, specifically mm, important amount of Bohemian history videos, something about Poland, Hungary, etc. We still lack, yes, we never talked about Serbia in detail, for example, or or Bulgaria, or other, you know, important realities. We made, I remember once, a video on um, 14th century Lithuanian uh, panoply, uh, nightly panoply, things like these. Well, in, in the future, we will definitely um, see these things more often, and this video is perhaps uh, not entirely sure, may be the last of this kind, unless you particularly like uh, the, the formula, but simply i running out also kind of um, comparative um, possibilities here in terms of this from, from this general perspective, right? And I hope that still you, you, you will pass me the, the approximation of this all, because the sense of this type of video is fundamentally to show the differences and analogies of these uh, monarchies with uh, essentially within themselves and with the Western ones specifically, right? We, in fact, we already addressed, broadly speaking, the question of Central, Eastern, Balkan, Europe, and its, uh, it, its political institutional development as territorial powers, what they were about, and, and say, pointing out the main characteristics. Well, this is a bit of a continuation of it. And uh, so let's simply get star started. So, um, first of all, we are talking about very different realities, right? When we, we point out analogies, we're definitely looking at something that is very difficult to compare in nature, if not for some, you know, some broader demographic, economical, political, and institutional uh, dimension, factors, right? Uh, we're talking about, I don't know, even territories belonging to the empire, right? Uh, the Bohemian Kingdom was part of. Uh, in the, in the, we could digress here, starting to, to, to explain why, how, but we, we already covered a bit this. I think I made a video on the rise of the Peninsulates in 10th century Bohemia. That explains also with, you know, the rise of Hungary, um, the, the conversion of the time. Today, we mostly look at low medieval history, right? So in a moment in which these monarchies were already formed, and in which they were starting to take certain directions that were fundamentally, as we will see, towards the um, the ever more you know fixed elective character of the monarchy that actually brought to, to, to a weakening of, of the same political unity on the long run, so much that um, an important part of these areas were overrun, essentially, by conquerors or uh, simply uh, external dynasties, but didn't evolve into what essentially Western European countries would um, during the during the modern age, right? So what happens in these last medieval centuries is is quite quite important, right? So in the 14th and 15th century, these um, regions of Central Eastern Europe, from let's say the Baltic Sea to the Mediterranean to the, to the Black Sea, from the uh, Polish Lithuanian plains up to the uh, Carpathian and Balkan mountains, right? Um, went through um, essentially a uh, a decisive phase of institutional and political territorial transformation. These transformations um, are, in this sense, the, the sap of this comparative analysis, right? Because they, you realize they were different for, from what, what, what was happening in Western Europe. In fact, um, if um, Bohemia may be the only exception here, because, exactly because it was framed within the empire, eventually it was taken over by, by the Habsburgs, um, and 
that fits into, in fact, a more evidently, you know, yes, it's still Central Europe, culturally speaking, but still it's framed within within Germany that Germany is unframable in this. I, I afford, you know, I made an effort to, to, to answer the question, you know, where, what in, in this picture, by these standards, where does Germany lay, right? It's really in between. And that's why we will have, we started uh, recently, a, you know, a new series about uh, medieval Germany, medieval Italy, to better properly realize what you know the Holy Roman Empire was about because even in the modern age those areas were in fact different from both the western monarchies and the the, the eastern ones right as a matter of fact there weren't monarchies much at least you know they, they were just a uh, patch of you know principalities and uh, not all the time. there is a federative aspect in there that is never to be forgotten um, but um, let's say uh, we, if we look, for example, uh, coming back to our point, uh, to the uh, monarchic princely uh, institutional profile that is basically prevalent everywhere in these areas, um, well, this um, it was undoubtedly influenced by Western models, right? Uh, especially, this is evident for especially those powers that fell in, eventually into Roman Catholicism, Poland. Bohemia, Hungary, right? You know, they they all had, especially in the you know the the two main ones in the in the easternmost areas, very important. Um, in fact, uh, Orthodox influences and all what ca- comes through that culturally, etc. But uh, fundamentally, these were all mm, decisively impacted by f- um, yeah uh, Frankish feudalism, by Western. Mm, Western political institutional models, they they were more advantageous, right? These countries were simply more exposed to that civilization. They grew more rapidly because of that. Uh, when, when you look at Eastern Europe proper, you, you see something else, right? And in fact, you can't even say properly that even when you look at Russia, right? It, you, well, this influence fits sometimes in, in, um, from the East uh, on these Central European monarchies, not very differently from which the, the, the Tartar or, or Turkish uh, influence properly was, right? Especially after the Mongol invasions, for which uh, the Russian political and military culture was essentially a, an emanation of, of the Tartar one, right? You know, yeah, at a level of ferocious, princely, mm, private mm, uh, political culture, that is something that objectively, yes, um, but not even Russia... Uh, itself had had right in this picture uh, before the time because in this picture we we should point out that the Kemen Rus had been in fact much relatively but still importantly and evenly more similar to what you know these Central European markets had been right uh, even just as in uh, it, as an influential model but properly because of the political and social balance of its state of its estates right after the Mongol invasion that that changes a big deal. Right, and maybe the, the the most interesting country to 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 spot this 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 uh, you know frontier dimension is Lithuania, that at some point could join with Poland as much as it could join with Russia. Right, it was have actually joined with um, uh, with uh, with Moscow, but then eventually, you know, it was for Poland. That was a very important shift in in, um, in Eastern European history, uh, and uh, it you know it could have led to sensibly sensibly different history. At that point, and so here you have to be able also to look at geography, at demographics, um, and these important external conditioning, right? Especially in the eastern and southern borders, because as we will see also from the Balkans, well, you know, with the rise of the Ottoman Turks, that you know changed an enormous deal, because it's fundamentally because of the Ottoman invasions that we have today the, the narrower concept of Western Europe, right? Before that. Uh, already the European one was relatively, we made a video about this res- recently, was relatively more, you know, but it, the, the Ottomans contributed to define it as most conflicts bring to uh, in identitary terms. And also, you know, we have that huge chunk of, of Europe in the southeast that was a Christian one, um, the European, it was subdued by the Ottomans and remained there for, for hundreds of years until the 19th, the 20th century, right? So the prince, um, let's say, um, the characteristics of the 
main political entities of uh, this European, let's call it region, but it's larger, right? So we're talking about Poland, Bohemia, and Hungary, mainly, right? So we will talk also about the Balkans, naturally. Um, uh, we, uh, we naturally have to talk a little bit, at least of uh, indispensably of uh, in us rapidly, um, unfortunately, of the main dynastic and the political and military uh, events, and the irrelevance of which, uh, if we can, you know, generalize a bit uh, as an observation, is often sacrificed and overlooked in the name of an abstract uh, institutional, say, modelism. Right, the videos we made up to this point in comparative sense the Central, Eastern, Balkan, um, uh, European monarchies are, and also historiographically they, and that's why they, by the way, start mostly from saying, "Oh, look, these guys had something in common from a, essentially the the institutional development of their polities." Right. Um, it's generally there. There is a bit of teleologism because what you see at the end is a basically a general general failure of uh, of, of state building in a sense right from from, from a while that they kept going on for for centuries thinking about Poland but you know how it ended compared to to western european developments in the end so and there the 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 the, the balance um or the internal balance of these um of these communities was even set in this point and uh, you know, th there was nothing deterministic about their uh, th that outcome, right? Uh, we also saw how, for example, the same rise of the Ottomans was something much more easily stoppable than it was is usually believed, right? Uh, I know that ethno-nationalistic narratives want to stress that you know the, the Ottomans were the, the greatest power ever that overwhelmed this, you know more, you know, heroic midges that stood their ground, etc. But the truth is, actually, the Ottomans were basically uh, kept alive, literally, by the same Western powers. I mean, you're talking about Venice, the Knights of Rhodes, right? Those were supposed also by crusading, you know, to, to, to keep them uh, away. But, of course, uh, m m politics that has zero to do with, uh, with moralism and much to do with intelligence and practice actually produced a situation that was was um, couldn't be calculated, right? Uh, the, the 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 balance that brought to the rise of the Ottomans, their conquest of the Balkans was very random. Uh, if you look at what literally up to even the the early the early fifteenth century, uh, the, the balance around there really was right. And there is a lot of overestimation, in my opinion, also. Of of uh, not much of, of the Ottoman power in itself, but let's say in, in the qualitative um, capacities of uh, properly of, of, of such power in general. But it could have been the the uh, any emerging one, right? It's very easy to make ideologism about certain figures here just because they stood um, against the the Ottoman advance. But the reason the for most of the collapse of the Balkans was properly laced within the, the pretty messed up political social reality of these these countries. As we will see, the Hungarian peasants were much happier under Ottoman administration and under the, the Magyar magnates, right? And this is for for anybody who has known what 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 these powers were really about, right? In Poland it didn't happen because the Turks are just arrived at its gates, right? But the, the the sheer ferocity of the elites that here had basically aborted uh, the possibility of creating a, a state worth of this name uh, was translated in the fact that for them peasants were subhuman beings, right? That they treated them as animals and exploited them in ways that are, you know, some of the most radically violent probably in the entire history of mankind. With with a an ideological ferocity that is the, the same, in fact, the same obtusity that brought to the failure of state. So yes, some monarchs were objectively enlightened in this regard, but they couldn't also do much about you know trying to, to solve the main problem. By the 15th century, these these states basically said nuts to anybody who tried to centralize them further. And there is nothing romantic or or you know r romantically let's say um, 
in, t in terms of freedom or other things that this th that's properly the denial of civilization that is to say look on the other side when when you are properly um, under attack uh, because you want to keep just your your individual privilege and that, that's what, what what happens in most history actually uh, this can be observed in so many other uh, during the Italian wars during you know um, unfortunately lack of political cohesion is the the main the main common uh, element in here and but the reasons of such lack are to be investigated in, in, in the in the background of these communities given the picture that we have outlined any national consideration goes out of the window because if these people had truly cared about their country would have behaved very differently uh, at some point and uh, but again we can't even blame this in in a theological perspective because eventually these countries failed as states right it, it it's obvious that at the time you know the same background required say more caution but more ambiguity but also less vision capability right um and uh, this brought fundamentally into the uh, you know um into this uh, dynamic that is in the, the essentially mo in modern history brought in the political and military edge care of the absolute say states um hungary uh and bohemia with their absburgic imperial domination right poland um the same uh, uh, the same scandinavian states at some point and we don't have to forget either that in the 14th century the balkan area that had seen the consolidation of statual uh, forms of reigns and principates that were territorially extended and not really devoid of resources and ambitions for example serbia mainly bulgaria the principalities of moldavia and of Wallachia. right the the serbian state in particular uh, thanks to the military capacity of its mountaineers and um, had had known uh, a great expansion in the central decades of the 14th century when it basically managed to emarginate um, the Byzantine presence and to prevail also military over Bulgaria which was historically new you, you know that essentially Serbia was emerged within the Byzantine domination right and they always tried to kind of autonomize them further eventually Byzantine state collapsed so this left Serbia as well as you know the resurgence of, of, of the Bulgarian Empire uh, but mm, that's an area that because of its war uh, warlike character had resources to spend in that fish Stephen Dusan that pro having proclaimed uh, himself Emperor of Serbia in 1355 was actually planning the conquest of Constantinople and if you look at the balance of powers there yeah, I mean, if the Turks had not emerged, um, probably Serbia would have consolidated a quite important domination in in the in the Central Balkans. Uh, in the latter decades, these mm, this potential, let's say, was however stopped by this plur plurisecular long wave of the Turkish expansion right and uh, some dates here are key like the, the battle of Kosovo Polia against the Serbian 1389 Nicopolis against the Crusaders mostly the Hungarians in 1396 brought to the consolidation of the Ottoman domination in the Balkans including Greece uh, the Adriatic shores ex excluded just a little part of uh, the coastal Venetian Dalmatia uh, and uh, this, the Ottomans generally blocked for for s multiple centuries, up to in fact the 19th, the 20th century, the evolution of societies of Christian tradition in these regions of Central Southern Europe, and in particular, the uh, the the same existence of an autonomous Serbian state was brought to an end. Right. This is extremely important to understand because literally 
um, the, the potential of these. Um, just imagine what the Balkans would have been without the Ottoman domination. Because this is not... Uh, yes, okay, these this powers were, were evidently weaker, um, so they succumbed, and there were lots, however, still of, of uh, you know, conjunctures, as we've seen, that might have gone, made things gone different. So, even just, you know, the fact that Europe still wish, uh, witnessed genocide in the Balkans up to some, some decade ago, uh, and that, you know, is it, still part of a, of a Balkan question that has not been truly settled, is the product of not just a domination, right, uh, but properly the destruction of a, the, the abortion of a status creation, and the transformation especially of certain areas into areas of frontier, that here I don't want to, you know, be too, too harsh, but of course the same, um, you know, the, the same Byzantine Empire had fundamentally rendered as such, right, uh, it's part of the reason why these states evolved you know, still slowly and with certain rhythms. Uh, Hungary, altogether, was more like a king, uh, an empire than a kingdom, really. But even its, you know, the, the lands where it extended its power were something very different from, I don't know, the neighboring Germany or even certain parts of the Byzantine Empire. So that uh, there was even in there um, probably a, an extended frontier, right? The, the Pannonian steppes are literally the, the, the westernmost end of the Eurasian steppes, the movements of peoples that pass through uh, south of the of the Carpathians to, uh, up to the, the Danube Valley for, for centuries, even think about the Pagenex, think about uh, the Cumans, right? The, the, that was, you know, a, a reality that the Balkans, in, in te- well, why do we talk of Balkanization? Probably we invented this term because the this area had been unstable, had been historically kind of a frontier, right? Uh, just um, after, especially you know the, the the contraction of Roman power in the Nubian area, but also historically think about certain regions like Mesia that correspond also with, with Serbia, in part certain important centers um, uh, of power around it. it were you know historically the the least um, you know, urbanized, where some of the, there were mountains, wild territories, by the way, some, some nightmare for, uh, as, a ba- as a battleground in general. Uh, also, the, the Ottomans learned quite, quite the hard way. I mean, there were certain areas in, in, in Montenegro or in Bosnia that could, couldn't practically even be controlled. It was just, a, you know, a, a, an Ottoman garrison there entrenched in some fortress. Um, up the mountains, but some communities couldn't properly even be uh, controlled because who would go into those valleys, into those forests? It was complicated. Also, there wasn't much there to seize in the first place. That's another matter, right? These were, as we will see, especially at the end of the, the video, less properly less developed, less resourceful areas in 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 some ways. They were resourceful in in you know in, in a broader perspective when such dominations managed to, to extend themselves territorially and then yes because even you know the Danubian uh, area uh, was I don't know ha- basically uh, was uh, one of the the, the, the the westernmost branches of the Silk Road um, the, the were important connections historically especially with Hungary and not just by origin but when it was some you know steps in Middle Eastern powers we see it even from from their equipment, their military culture, were mm, very. Mm, there is a great similarity, great contact through through through, through the Danube, the Black Sea, with certain populations um, of the East, that um, definitely give you back a picture of 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 of, of cultures in, in countries that that were looking at definitely different dimensions compared compared to the West. This is an important divide. You see, that's also why the Balkans probably had some kind of... Uh, there are important boundaries. There are the Dinaric Alps. There, there, there is properly this constant um, threat because of the open um, you know, uh, way to, to, to the steps there that uh, must be coped with. So the, the, their interest was naturally to cope with that. Serbia received um, important, for example, Russian influence historically. Uh, throughout the centuries, um, they found 
often more interest to, towards the, the, the eastern area than the west. So it was an area that had a very different dynamics from, from the rest of Europe, including properly, you know, areas such as properly even um, Poland, Bohemia, because Hungary um, was, yes, importantly Germanized at some levels of political institutional culture, but uh, had a very important Eastern influence. Uh, especially Byzantine, but not all, right? And and that's that corresponded to logics that even you know a few hundred kilometers away from the other side of the Adriatic, for example, were completely you know away. Think about Venice. That the Venetians did just cared about the sea, right? What happened in the interland was of relative importance. Just you know control of certain cities uh, close to the coast. That that was pretty much it. Where they contended with the Hungarians, but otherwise, logics were very different. Even when these powers try to sum up, for example, uh, dynastically various crowns, it was a time where you know the king of Hungary was the one of Poland, the one of Naples. There are interesting um, at the same time, I mean, um, you know, constructions that have to do chiefly with Bohemia, Hungary, and Poland that shared often this. But that's mostly the proof of the failure of uh, a territorial, the, 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 properly the, the rooting of a territorial power, right? And that reflects actually the, the, the elected deal of, you know, that, of this no, ethnic nobility that essentially didn't want to be ruled by a strong ethnic dynasty on a local base, as they had had, like, like the Harpads in Hungary, the Permislets in Bohemia, and the uh, Piasts in, in Poland, right? They preferred foreigners to say, okay, you know, so that they, they wouldn't have much of an influence, and in fact, um, that that's a knot that should be studied more, not even properly for for the 14th or the 15th century, but the 13th, because that's where the the roots laid, where some of these, um, you know, properly these older ethnic dynasties had uh, accomplished some of the most ferocious struggles against the ethnic nobility. Um, we um, we can say a bit the same thing in perspective for the same fall of Constantinople in 1453 and its consequences, right? So all the um, Slavic, Greek, Albanian, Romanian populations of the Balkan area were substantially and, you know, stably um, subdued with actually rare um, motions of, of revolts, right, in, yeah, famous that there is back um, in Albania during the second half of the 15th century. Very important, uh, you know, yeah, there, there are some resistance that you can't imagine, but they, they were mostly, you know, politically interested. They never quite, sometimes they preferred definitely Ottoman support than, you know, Western support uh, in those areas because they enjoyed the centralized position in the area. We have seen it very neatly also as in the videos we make about the the siege of uh, the 1683 siege of Vienna, with all the nuisances of you know what what, what the what Hungary was doing, what the the Wallachians did, the, right? The, in, in there, you you see properly that also for centuries these populations actually cooperated with the Ottomans in a way that was naturally about the local elites to consolidate their power over the peasantry, over the over a reality that didn't actually present much of a different possibility of you know of management what were these countries did they have the same uh, urban centers or economical dynamism of, of the west the american absolutely not these were essentially um, this was the latifundum right what well, they were estates ruled by feudal nobility and as we'll see in fact even the military power uh, of these creations before the Ottoman conquest were essentially made up of that, right? It wasn't much of a, you know, rise of, for example, of infantry or, you know, something that is socially or politically comparable to what was happening in Western Europe. Um, so some decade later, also in the Danubian area, a bit more north, let's say, the political military situation would have been modified in a substantial way. Um, in the case of the Kingdom of Hungary, there is the emblematic and catastrophic uh, military defeat suffered against the Turks at Moach in 1526. 
So from that moment on, Hungary is basically attracted definitely in, in, in the orbit of the uh, Habsburgic Empire that will carry out for centuries a sort of, um, you know, vault, you know, of, of anti-moral political and religious function properly of um, of Christian European civilization for for a number of, of reasons. We're even there also very concretely political. The same Habsburgs had fundamentally backstopped the Hungarians at the time of the Ottoman invasion. Um, their their situation was not definitely not one of the most florid ones, economically speaking, either. They risked in the early 16th century have already Vienna conquered. Um, they were joining there in the Catholic you know, alliance with the dynastic some of the Spanish crown and the, you know, the Austrian possession. Um, they were the same Austria, certain regions of Germany were, were not very different actually from, from these other areas, right? Albeit were definitely more dynamic, richer, more entrepreneurial. The, the German, as we'll see, the German mercantile element had been in the same, uh, in these Slavic countries in general, you know, actually the, the sap of, t together with Jewish trade, of, in fact, of commercial activities. Right, and that's where the process of Westernization had come because the, the especially the ethnic uh, royal dynasties had brought as many merchants, knights, etc., from all the countries in Western Europe into their own kingdoms to to back the push of the uh, the, the centralistic, uh, the centralizing uh, ethnic nobility, right. Uh, but in the first decades of the 14th century, two princely, let's say two Western, properly princely dynasties had substituted in the kingdoms of Bohemia and of Hungary, the, uh, respectively the Autochthonous dynasties, respectively the Permisleths and of the Arpads, um, that were organized fundamentally in the form of a patrimonial monarchy. That is, um, you know, while Western states were Western monarchies were developing, as we've seen also recently, some properly statal apparatuses um, in a central form. These these countries had, you know, had uh, you know a central monarchy in the form essentially of a guy that held more wealth than than the the other oligarch, than the other aristocrats, right? But not quite developing a true um, statal system. In in thirteen ten. John of Luxembourg, son of the Holy Roman Emperor Henry the Seventh, um, began in Bohemia the multi-secular presence of his own house. It was essentially a French one, uh, and um, this um, presence would reach its apex, uh, renowning with the, with the long reign of Charles the Fourth, thirteen forty-seven, thirteen seventy-eight. Charles the Fourth was. In fact, Kingdom of Bohemia and Holy Roman Emperor, Prague, Bohemia at this point were truly the, the political, uh, at some levels of the proper cultural center of, of, of medieval Europe. Right? It enjoyed a great, Prague enjoyed a great uh, development at this point where there were some forms, in fact, of attempts of centralizing. But as we will see, uh, even these attempts were still acting in a reality where it was maybe because of this you know, strong, bolded figures such as Charles that could, you know, uh, be considered by the Bohemian chroniclers as the father of, of the fatherland, <laughs> um, but that uh, would open also to the following decades to the crisis uh, of, uh, of Hussitism in, in, in a way um, that we have discussed also recently. So for the Bohemian kingdom, naturally, this this phase was was very positive, right? Also at the level of uh, territorial expansion. For example, Bohemia came to control dynastically Brandenburg at that point. Um, in in Hungary, the situation was different, right? Um, there was the installation of uh, with the papal with papal support, by the way, of the Anjou, right? At, the, at this point, were basically the the ultra power out there because they were essentially French royalty, to, and at that point, the French were basically everywhere. Like they were in France. Provence, um, uh, Naples, uh, they had some Greek possessions. They get the Hungarian crown as well, and, and plus also they will in, in Poland. So um, there was a naturally an Hungarian interest to, to, to get, as we've seen this, fundamentally foreign dynasties to, to, to 
have just them as hosts, not as you know masters properly. Uh, Charles Robert was king from 1308 to 1342, and eventually Louis uh, between 1342 and 82. Right, this was important because uh, Hungary was, um, let's say, importantly also westernized in the process. That the French here brought some kind of, um, you know, in fact properly of, of more some of the, the updated models of government etc but they couldn't properly radically alter what the the control of the ethnic nobility and the various chunks of the empire really was consider that hungary was created as we were saying before properly as a as a I could say even a, as a step power in the sense that properly every clan had its own chunk of the kingdom right very well outlined in many ways there, there were central offices but the idea was that there was this huge power that could you know spread around again around this enormous set of territories if you read the titles of of the hungarian crown it, it's, it, it doesn't doesn't stop right ever it's something extremely long um different ethnicities the different subjects languages even confessions right so um certain areas were most, they they stretch from from italy to russia Basically, um, and um, from from the German speaking land to the to the to the Greek speaking land, almost, and the um, um, so it was properly also military domination. Let's be let's be honest about it. it was a, a strong military bias of the steppe conquerors in the Hungarian political and institutional culture. A kingdom like Bohemia was much more of a Western thing, right? At that point, it was smaller, it was more compact, also you know geographically well outlined it had important resources it had important you know, also urban centers um um if it hadn't been for the size of the country a bit poland was a bit like that right as we will see in a while uh but keeping to speak about hungary well uh and louis um uh, the angevin king uh he uh, carried out especially this vigorous policy of military expansion towards the south right Right in the Bosnian and Croatian area mostly, and towards the Adriatic. So coming also to threaten seriously Venice herself, that uh, and he obtained also for a brief time the throne of Bohemia. Right, um, Hungary wanted the uh, a maritime control, right? Because as we've seen, the Angevins controlled also Naples, so they wanted to connect Hungary with uh, with it through the Adriatic, but. Venice stood in the middle. There were ferocious struggles. It was the, there was the siege of, of Tsar. It was taken back and forth. It was, um, you know, very harsh fights. And also the Bosnian heirs, not an easy ground. The Croatians also, right, you know, weren't dramatically happy of, you know, being in the middle of this. Um, and so um, mostly uh, these powers were, uh, you see, the, the advantages, the differences of, for example, of a maritime republic like Venice that had a you know more compact, ter basically a very few, ter just a coastal territorial control, right, and that couldn't join and you know from its m m essentially financial capacities, this, this you know to interfere also in the in the Balkan interland. This would uh, happen later on even against the, the the Ottomans. I mean, think about how the Venetians and the Habsburgs backed the the Serbian Hajduks, ger um, guerrilla fighters against the uh, the Turks, or, well, you see, having instead a, a huge kingdom, if not empire, like the one of Hungary, means that, that every, I don't know, dynastic problem that regularly occurred at some point, um, or weakness of civil war, you know, the all the surroundings, all the frontier, all the outer areas of, of this domination are all of a sudden thrown in turmoil, right? This Properly means that local rulers, backed by lat laterally always the, the, the surrounding powers, are seizing royal assets, uh, fortresses, and you know even if central power is restored, it takes other campaigns, other force to eventually uh, grab this this land one, once again, right? Uh, so these monarchs were were always that this is typical of the Middle Ages in general. Also in the West was a bit like they're always floating. But with on this these communities that, that 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 they had to constantly negotiate with, and in these areas even more marked, right? Even the acquisition of Louis by Louis of, for example, the, the crown of Bohemia. Well, that that is something that, as we were saying before, is very frequent in this 
um, in the, among these three kingdoms with Poland included uh, because it was a way just to surpass that local incapability of, of con you know of firm territorial control direct centralized control by seizing grabbing as much as you could in terms of revenues from other countries that you didn't even control directly but you were namely king of right and speaking of Poland that uh, up to that point had been fractioned into different principalities um, pre prevailed in the uh, first decades of the 14th century under bohemian pressure the uh, local dynasty of the Piasts with Ladislas the uh, said the short king since 1320 and his son Casimir the Great 1333-1370 right um, and Wu the latter you know was protagonist of a you know gradual territorial unification Poland had enjoyed essentially this moment of important uh, power on, in, in the 11th century 10th 11th century right when the Piasts properly established their control then eventually it, it split into this series of, of principalities um, that uh, were like, I can say like a bit like in Russia, like, but to just give you the idea, it's all kind of independent powers fundamentally or that however share namely the same dynastic blood because they are all Piasts, right? They are more descent from, from the original dynasty, but there is no quite of a central control, right? In, in a way, the Bohemians, even the Hungarians enjoyed a more central power. But the Piasts are, differently from the Permislits and the Arpads that extinguished themselves before, capable in the 14th century to, re to with these two kings, Ladislas and Kazmir, to put things together, right, a little bit again, right, and to maintain this dynastic continuity, but to, re you know, strengthen the, the unity of, of, of this, mm, this complicated, also mm, territorially, Centennial geographically Poland, also considering the, the the surrounding powers that are not easy, right? As we've seen, even the Bohemian here take the, the, the offensive on, on Poland, which is, you know, um, and that reveals you the degree of fragmentation, because as we've seen, Bohemia was, wasn't that huge um, by itself, but it was possible interfering like that. Um, so we have to remember, naturally, uh, as Polish neighbors, technically vassals by name, but in practice also something much more dangerous, the um, the order Teutonic Knights, that it occupied the territories of Prussia and of Livonia on the Baltic, um, for which we, we can't but uh, remember the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. Uh, the Lithuanians also are living in this more wooded areas of, of the northeast. They, they are secluded from some certain important circles. You see uh, the, 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 Bo the, the, the Poles, the, the Bohemians, the Hungarians enjoy, after all, especially with these new dynasties and also with the older ones, kind of much more international uh, contact, right, and uh, relations and uh, westernization. Lithuania hadn't been properly like that. They had even remained pagans up to the 14th century. They were properly not, you know, the Lithuanians are not properly uh, they're not properly full, fully Slavic from an ethnic point of view, right? They're not properly, um, they, there's something on its own. They have an, uh, their own language, um, a specific culture, and they, they were warlike, right? Lithuania w uh, would rise at this point as an important power um, the, um, uh, on, on the, from the modest base of its original territory, right? With essentially an hereditary power, Right, that conferred properly the stability that was needed at that point to, for, for these otherwise not so you know stable realities to expand. Um, the starting f uh, from from the rule of the Grand Duke um, Jediminas and his descendants, in particular Algirdas, and uh, that is the father of uh, Yogai Yagel, the one who would start eventually the important uh, Lithuanian and eventually Polish. Uh, dynasty, a, a, a very extended domination on this mm, uh, the wide plain uh, stretching between the, the Baltic and the Black Sea right? it was really huge as a territorial domination, connecting also with the uh, with, with many Russian principalities right? the, the areas, uh, as you know, are also not the, the best ones, as you know, the Eastern Front can 
can remind you of them. They're they're often swamps, forests. They're they're tough grounds, right? But they're not dramatically populated, not extremely productive. But the, the Lithuanians reached this enormous power, right? They have properly a military control in this area, and they start interfering with the frag- fragmented Russia, with this, you know, richer and but not necessarily more politically compact Poland at some point. Eventually. As you know, even in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, uh, Poland was the, the, you know, the, the more civilized, the more, the more advanced part. Right, the Lithuanians eventually is just a dynasty that leaps on, but the true center of power would be Poland, that that goes on as a, as a state, right, for centuries. Whereas Lithuania, you know, was was a bit of a different thing. But still, it, this is also important because it it shows you how rapidly from these areas. Uh, you know, c- certain powers could emerge and eventually to, you know, resettle uh, at, at another level and, and the, the, the floating nature of these territorial dominations in time. So starting from the last decades of uh, the 14th and throughout all the 15th century, um, certain political and social transformations uh, radically diversified the territorial assets and the perspectives of the three westernmost kingdoms. Because in Poland, the extinction of the Piast dynasty um, and uh, the, uh, you know, following col- very complex dynastic events, so we're talking about the temporary passage to the crown to the Anjou as well, uh, also the brief dynastic union with the kingdom of Hungary, brought to the marriage of Edwig of Anjou with Jagiello, Grand Duke of uh, Lithuania, eventually King Ladislas III, to the conversion of Christianity of both Jagiello and his own people. So we were talking about 1385-87, and the political coordination between the two states, right? That would essentially be the the prodrome for the offensive against the order of the Teutonic Knights and its territory. This is very important because, as we were saying before. Lithuania could easily join with Russia, right? At that point, uh, it was actually more likely. So certain marriages, uh, you know, being arranged properly with the, the Russian ruling house, uh, they they end they, they ended finally with siding with with, with with Poland. But at that point, you realize even for the following military events, it would have been a a very different uh, history in the Baltic. That not only at that point. Um, in fact, the Teutonic Order, because of this, throughout the 14th century, was incorporated uh, into the great Polish-Lithuanian state. Right, The point of arrival of this is the Treaty of Torun in 1466 with the creation of Polish Prussia. Um, uh, even if um, the order maintained very, con- very conspicuous possessions um, uh, destined to... Uh, constitute rather late on around 1525 the uh, basic nucleus of the first Lutheran state in Europe right considered that the Teutonic order had been established in Poland as a vassal so technically the Polish kings uh, received uh, the homage of Teutonic but eventually they had taken over because the te- uh, you know the, the, the Teutonic Knights had Occupy the most important, the most productive areas of, of the coastline, right? Uh, with the Ansa, with this properly, the Teutonic Order was, uh, you know, possessed as an as a clerical state, um, one of the single most centralized um, political administrative uh, realities in medieval Europe, right? Whereas the Polish and the Lithuanian interland was was much different, fundamentally less less productive. But the, the 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 dynastic union of Poland and Lithuania broke still to the fit. It was very hard, hardly fought, as, as you know. Um, so in, in Poland and Lithuania, the Jagiellonians remained firmly in power with Casimir, 1447-1492. Uh, and with his um, sons, even uh, though in um, uh, still of a continuous movement and, and contrast within the same dynasty. Right, you can't fix the problem. If there, if the pre, you know, before that there wasn't properly much of a, uh, of a unity. Right, uh, you can't create it from literally one generation to another. 
Speaking of Bohemia and Hungary, well, these were entrusted at the end of the 14th century to the two sons of Charles IV. So Wenceslas, king of Bohemia from 1378 to 1419, and Sigismund, king of Hungary from 1387 to 1437. And nominally also of Bohemia since 1419. So the Bohemian kingdom uh, went towards a serious crisis uh, after the development of, uh, of religious uh, of development of movement of religious reform guided by Jan Hus that spread soon we, we made a video very recently about this the Bohemian diets during you know basically the ousting of royal authority um, in for for an important so for, for that fundamentally that in, expanded soon uh, at a social political level so in part these were as we've seen the the, the urban um, communities partially also the peasants against the aristocracy not quite uh, just it was not not only at least uh, the aristocracy was bit in between it eventually took over again it was mostly about a foreign rule um, so this brought to some important wars that were fought by Bohemia both uh, offensively and defensively so Hussitism um, soon spread also, as you know, in a, you know between a, a radical and moderate uh, wings. Um, so we're talking about the Taborites against the Calistines. And this had a deep meaning for the development of uh, properly a Czech national consciousness and awareness. But on the... Um, from a cultural point of view, but from a narrowly, strictly political point of view, it determined, this is somewhat overlooked, throughout the whole 15th century, where the technical use uh, high movement was in power, a substantial isolation of the kingdom, right? Aside from the wars that caused a, a dramatic economical crisis, the, the population, uh, you know, there was an important decrease, properly in the, in the subjects of the kingdom, Properly, an extranation from European policy, right? Bohemia during the 15th century was not at all the one that the, the, the of, of the previous one, where it was the center of Europe. Here, it was kind of like in a bubble, right? And this is important in, in a moment in European history where you know international relations were literally taking off in terms of political effectiveness and need and capacity and organization. So, 15 years of anarchy also, for example, followed the death of Albert of Habsburg, um, destined to, su to, to succeed to Sigismund in 1439, uh, until the affirmation of George Podebrady, who restored um, in a national monarchy in Bohemia. In Hungary, Sigismund of Luxembourg didn't have the charisma and the military um, gift, let's say, of the predecessor Louis of Anjou. And he was prevalently concerned with the matters of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, the Turkish attacks from one side, uh, the Venetian pressure from the other, brought also to a drastic resizing uh, of Hungarian territorial domination. Um, starting from the mid-15th century, uh, however, uh, emerged from uh, because of his military capabilities, the Hungarian na uh, noble uh, John Hunyadi, right? Uh, Bo's son uh, Matthias, actually Matthew, called Matthias Corvinus, king from 1458-1490, brought uh, in uh, Hungary a. Uh, uh, policy of reforms within the kingdom and of great political and military dynamism towards the external attacking Bohemia that was deprived of Moravia Poland and Austria so even basically uh, bringing uh, Vienna uh, in his domination and even appointing it as capital of the same between the 14th and the 15th century, for a short time, the princes of the Polish Jagiellonian dynasty uh, were in power both in Bohemia and in Hungary. The Turkish pressure 
So, you remember the Battle of Moach, and also the Habsburgic one brought in the first decades of the 16th century to the partition of Hungary between the, basically the two powers, the framing of Bohemia within the sphere of influence of the imperial dynasty, marking uh, political um, scenarios that were destined to last for for a long time. Right. Also, the Polish-Lithuanian kingdom was destined to suffer in perspective uh, the um, political and military pressure of, of Russia, but much later on, right? After, especially the, during, you know, after the, the end of the 17th century, mostly, uh, beginning of the 18th. And therefore, uh, and for with the same reasons why the, you know, the, the, the Polish state suffered this gradual lagging uh, uh, in terms of centralizing policies in the surrounding states, right, for the elective nature of the Schlacht, uh, that, you know, of the Polish monarchy that was aristocracy, didn't want to give up its privileges and so on. So for all these three principalities of Central Eastern Europe, uh, there, there was the, the end, properly the termination of this actually significant phase of social and political uh, and institutional development. So, in a comparative perspective, analogies between the uh, monarchic institutions of the kingdoms of Central and Eastern Europe and the Western monarchies. Uh, first of all, uh, we, uh, we, we can see the royal initiative, right? The unitary tension that animated it, the attempt of centralization. That um, is uh, that they are witnessed, for example, by the um, the drafting of uh, written norms of customary law during the 14th century, more in general, the elaboration of laws um, for the entire kingdom. Uh, for example, I don't know the Statuta Casimiri Magni or the uh, Statutes of uh, Wisleka Piotrkov uh, in 1347 in Poland the Maestas Carolina of Charles IV, that uh, was actually re repelled, rejected by the, the Bohemian nobility. Um, the Code of Stephen Dushan, right, in, in Serbia, and the orientation towards some form of juridical unification. The situation appeared particularly complex in Poland, uh, where during the course of the 13th century, the German law, so-called um, the, 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 the law of Magdeburg had spread, had basically had entrusted, you know, had conferred a certain uh, liberty both to the, um, uh, the, 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 essentially the peasants immigrated in the countryside, often also from, from abroad, um, and to the uh, merchants that were active in the boroughs and the cities. And uh, this is framed in the complex, growing spread of written documentation, naturally, that is backed by the activity of, cha uh, of chancellors coming from the West, mm -hmm. not surprisingly, because that's exactly where those processes of state-making were being carried out, mostly. Um, also, the fa another very important um, uh, royal policy was the foundation in within by the way a few decades of the University of Prague in 1347 the one of Krakow in 1364 eventually refounded in 400 1400 excuse me and the same precarious attempts to create university institutions in Pax in Hungary in 1367 thir uh, uh, and in Kelmno in the uh, state of the Teutonic Order uh, so these are historical universities in Europe that were born exactly out of that specific attempt of centralization. Uh, strongly meaningful was also the symbiosis with the uh, monarchy and the ecclesiastical institutions that were oriented to carry out this, the, the classical function of legitimization slash sacralization of royal authority. Also through the cult of national saints, and in particular with the promotion of the cult of uh, saint kings, such as in Serbia, uh, but especially in Bohemia, uh, 
with St. Wenceslas in Hungary with St. Stephen and many other kings of the Arpad dynasty. This doesn't have to be underestimated. We can't frame it just into this low medieval uh, context. But uh, there is, in these countries, a, a very strong... Right? This is even at also in Poland. If you go look at their medieval art, for example, uh, it, it, there is um, this very uh, intense ideology of martyrdom. Right? Serbia, nationally speaking, is fundamentally that... Right, there, there is properly nothing around. It, it's it's the, the idea of the existence of blood of the, of the sufferings, properly in the flesh. Right, in this, if you want darker view, it's also not just because they fought against you know important enemies that you know about Kosovo, Poland, and this stalemate. They, they even you know it was a bath of blood for, for both contents, but properly also because of the military culture of these peoples. Right, the Slavs here, this is very actually interesting. You can get it from their literature compared to, I don't know, what was, I don't know, the German literature, the Western literature of the time was all about, you know, a feudal view uh, of so the Romanity of the Empire, the universality of it. These countries maintained instead a kind of a more properly ethnical, almost tribal mentality about the stock, their ancestors. It had a very different view. Um, of, 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 of themselves in this picture, right? Um, we'll see it better where with, with properly what, how they identify them like. Consider that this happened also because they weren't framed within an empire mm -hmm. except for Bohemia, but Bohemia was still s somewhat I think on its own in the empire, right? But properly the idea that you don't have to respond to, to a medium uh, on earth, but to God directly made this, you know, saints were also often warrior saints, right? Uh, the, the So you, you understand what the division behind that. And this relation with the church is, is very, is, is well expressed also in the deep differences of, in fact, of, uh, b between the, the lens of older and more recent Christianization, right? Uh, think about the Lithuanians who were still pagan by the 14th century. Uh, by the by choice, it was a political nature, right? Uh, of course, still the uh, political decision. Not the, the society is sure that was not, you know, maybe dramatically receptive compared to other more you know Christianized peoples from from these external for the external religious influences. But properly, there was a this was used uh, also in terms of gluing as a gluing political. Um, factor and by I mean the Lithuanians were fighting against a, a mil, uh, religious military order uh, like the Teutonic state so it was a big no to that conquest to, to say okay we're still pagan in, in nature but there, there's not some you know dramatic civilizational principle behind that like you know in general paganism was, was no match by by any stretch of the imagination, even just by a in ideological level with the Christian, it simply was a non, you know, system. Um, but properly, we're talking about the modifications, also the ecclesiastical uh, districtuation system, that were extremely important for the state building of these kingdoms. Um, it it tended to overlap essentially with the territory of the kingdom, right, and it's um, hinged on, let's say, few but extended dioceses, right? So they these reflect mostly these big landlordly powers that you know, so the church properly embodied. Uh, they, uh, they were affirmed in the um, archbishop seats of uh, Bohemia, such as Prague, the archdiocese of, uh, in, in the time of Charles IV, in Hungary, in Lithuania in the 14th century. Uh, then also in Poland, um, we see the modification of ecclesiastical geography, albeit uh, the uh, seat of uh, Gniezno in the western part of the territory maintained its importance. And in Serbia, where the Orthodox faith, not the Catholic one of the other countries, remained always um, um, a, a very strong um, um, f element of the feeling of national identity proper, Stephen Dushan had uh, a patriarchy proclaimed, right? And uh, 
everywhere the bishops are present in the royal council and there is the you know the the, the normal osmosis is carried out between the clergy and the royal chancellor especially in these countries that as we've seen they had m m less of a you know administrative personnel uh, in, in the local communities, they had to recur often to, to, to external, um, you know, to, to, to external competence, right? So the, the clergy in these countries was the, the more educated rather than, you know, in the West, things were changing dramatically in the favor of lay, uh, of lay clerks, administrators, and so on. And more in general, it's important to remember the strong awareness of themselves, of their, of, 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 of the, the authority, the, the mission that animated such kings, right? And here it's exemplificative of, of, of what properly that their mentality was. The, the ambassador of Casimir the Great to Charles the, the Fourth, for example, uh, pointed out that while the emperor is subject to the pope, quote, Noster rex tenet coronam et gladium ad there. This is beautiful. Um, uh, this is the Polish king that had restored the unity of of, of, of of its kingdom from the top of its older dynastic, ethnic dynastic authority, Polish ethnic dynastic authority, telling to Charles IV, uh, essentially a Frenchman, Holy Roman Emperor, King of Bohemia, right, within properly the Holy Roman Empire, right, in fact, that while the emperor himself, so in theory the greatest superiority on earth possible, is subjective to the Pope, said our king maintains the crown and the sword by God. Right? So here you see what what the, the, the this this tells you so much. I mean the idea that how distant certain political institutional visions like the ones that existed in Western Europe with the empire, with the, the broader institutional role of the universal powers, etc. A country like Poland could claim this direct uh, bond link with God without any medium and essentially at the same level of the emperor, right? So this bit of Polish versus Bohemian kind of... Uh, uh, competition um, in in the picture, but still quite meaningful on properly what animated the beliefs of the of these rulers that are not to be underestimated properly from a cultural point of view. In other and not less essential environments, great importance have the also the tax uh, economical initiatives, as you can imagine, because it's always a matter of how much money you have to levy an arm, levy an arm, right? Because otherwise, what's your power? And uh, and not just for the generalization or re regularization of the royal tax demands, but uh, rather for the fact that the economy of the crown is capable of availing itself of a minor, um, yeah, minor re resource, right? Especially uh, the Bohemian and Hungarian silver played an important role in state building. Don't forget that these were actually important factors. Um, for the exercise of such prerogatives in vast territories, right? Uh, also with a scarce population, largely controlled by the nobility, fundamentally. Um, there was the need of officials that depended directly on the king, right? Because the there was it wasn't like the city, the strong city that could say you know we are the same level of the nobility, let's keep them out. Right, a bit of this happens in Bohemia, because especially the, the last Permislets had found an important amount of cities properly in, in an anti nobility sense, but still the nobility took over, and that's literally just speaking for the most urbanized of these countries, um, and um, so the king had properly to enforce with his own clientels he, royal power. And as we've seen before, this could happen just for, for mostly through private means and a patrimonial base. So it was a very ferocious struggle that already tells you how much more complicated it was to properly enforce it compared to, to other countries in Europe. Um, so 
um, their role appears particularly incisive and innovative in 14th century Poland during Louis the Short uh, and Casimir, Casimir the, the Great's um, reigns. So at, with the purpose of circumscribing the authority of the dukes, these kings widened the number of the starosta, capitane. So the starosta would be basically the... I don't know how to say, like the head of the local communities, right? So maybe villages, maybe towns, even cities, etc., of other uh, other communities. Um, so the non noblemen, so those that had in theory to yeah to to be opposed, they were often vexed, in fact, but vexated by when uh, nobility or power to hierarchize them, right? For example, uh, in in great in in Greater Poland, uh, the starosta had a very relevant power, uh, a higher power. These kings introduced the justiciari, right, for, you know, dislocated uh, over the territory and provided with judiciary as well as military competence, and that were ferociously opposed by the knights, by the old Yorks. And around the royal castles were gathered uh, military forces directly depending on the monarch. That's why also monetization is quite important. This is the, the great century of mercenarism in Europe, right? So also these kings have a bit more modest financial power, but still important one to maintain now permanent force, uh, professional troops, I mean. And, um, and it's only from the early 15th century that, however, we see properly mercenary troops entrusted to um, a figure, so, you know, in the state, properly in royal administration, such as the Etman, Regni Polonie Campiductor, right? So a commander in chief, properly of the of the Polish kingdom's forces. This was a big change from the 14th century, when Casimir the Great, as a still as a strong ruler, however, preferred to uh, strengthen the connection between um, uh, estate property and military service that is typical of the feudal age so this seems like uh, like too fast too little in a sense uh, for for the Polish royal resources altogether as a passage right but also let's not underestimate their their power altogether so for the sake of uh, comparison we also have to look at another aspect of state building that is the relation, in fact, between the monarchy and the nobility proper. Uh, this naturally has important uh, consequences on the military level, because these men were the, the, the largest landowners, so technically the ones that as vassals had to provide the larger forces for the, the royal army. Um, so this relation cannot be properly, uh, you know, stereotyped, standardized in in terms of um, contraposing terms of you know, hostility and subjugation, right? But um, an evolution, a general evolution, can be read during the 15th century, uh, and this is substantially unfavorable to the statal consolidation and the royal attempts of centralization. The noblemen won. This is the big difference that in this area of Europe, you could say still to this day, right, the reason why still up to last century or century before, the the reality was the large estate's owner and the rest of the peasantry, right, and nothing else, essentially. Well, started at that point, right, um, in, in spite of... Um, uh, the, um, the the difference between a small group and great oligarchic families was that were often the the duchy title holders title holders was not everywhere perceivable and um, compared to uh, let's say a wider um, you know uh, state of, of of lesser nobility aristocratic society presented naturally. Uh, different characteristics in the different kingdoms. At the beginning of the 14th century, Bohemian aristocracy had on its shoulders uh, a century of feudal relation with the premislets of Ottokar I and Ottokar II. Right? It was a more Frankicized power. 
um, here the king had comparatively a stronger um, territorial power prop. Um, also, but since the, the the late 13th century, Bohemian seigneurial economy is is already stable, right? Since the time instead of uh, King John of Luxembourg, the the early the early 14th century, well, the uh, Bohemian nobility began uh, to show this national intolerance, right? The tendency that is to express its own identity, even when it was uh, differentiated from the one of the royal dynasty. And this, this naturally speaks for the fact that the Luxembourgs had properly been called in Bohemia. So they were hosts and in, from the perspective of the bo Bohemian nobility. And this had happened basically just because the Bohemians were, were threatened by the Habsburgs and at that point had you know, basically recently defeated them, had also briefly m obtained, at least nominally, even the, the Polish crown some point. The Habsburgs between the end of the 13th century and the very beginning of the 14th were, were, were actually pretty impressive in turn. Um, before the split in the two branches, as you know, it would be recomposed just in the 15th century. Um, so the Hungarian aristocracy instead was organized, as we've seen, by territorial um, groups. That is, every clan, every great lineage um, had this area of the country provided with large autonomies, properly on a territorial base, since the early clans, right, of, of the, you know, the Magyars, let's say, the, as a tradition. Um, and um, in some Polish regions, instead, the smaller nobility was more numerous, right? But, however, it wasn't particularly rich, right? It, uh, it didn't have much land, but it was socially privileged, so it was kind of more like a gentry. Uh, in Lithuania, the great property of the boyars had affirmed solidly as a consequence of the conversion to Catholicism, right? That naturally had brought to a further centralization of power. That had entrusted them the hereditarity of their lands, like in, like in the West. Um, this is important because the, the boyars, as you know, are sort of in Russia, like the, the main, like they, they're the ones who rule factually on the land. Uh, the princes were gaining, as we've seen, a greater ascendancy. There is still a very private um, culture of uh, of uh, you know of power of politics, right? Especially in Lithuania, where the, the urban potential, the 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 interference with the mere, uh, with the mere power of other classes was was even lower than than in the three westernmost kingdoms that we're discussing here. Even in the Serbian mountains, the small nobility constituted the bulk of S uh, Stephen Dushan's army. In simplifying, we could, however, talk of a, uh, a fort of, uh, of discipline carried out in the 14th century um, by the monarchies against the centrifugal tendencies, which, uh, is, which were particular evident as we've seen in the great aristocratic families that it was not just because they didn't really want just to to tear the, the kingdom apart they wish they had become kings on their own it's just that you know for that either you you behaved like that or you didn't so it was always problematic um, so this happened in the Poland of Casimir the Great in 14th century Bohemia Right, uh, where these attempts uh, had the support also of the uh, the royal attempts of centralization. I mean, the support of the of a rising bourgeoisie altogether. Poland and Bohemia here had were the most kind of Western line, right? As we had, we were to you know comparatively to to look at the social cross section. They had stronger middle classes than say Hungary or even more Lithuania or Serbia, right? So a formal organization by states or stände was defined in the second half uh, of the 14th century in general. In Poland, the uh, Kosice Charter of 1374 sanctioned the principle of the necessity of the consensus for extraordinary uh, tax demands. In Bohemia, also Charles IV had um, uh, so um, rejected uh, from by, uh, from the, 
by the Bohemian nobility the uh, important documents such as the Maestas Caroline. The greater capacity of, uh, say, of blackmailing conditioning uh, uh, were proper of the Hungarian nobility because already in 1351 Louis II extended to the small nobility the privileges uh, that the uh, greater nobility already enjoyed. Uh, the king uh, elected couldn't govern before the coronation oath in which he committed himself to preserve all the rights and all the liberties, right? And uh, the evolution of this trend is general, right? So Hungary was definitely a place where the oligarchs had, from an institutional point of view, the greater say in the matters of the kingdom, and this was spreading deep also at the lesser nobility. So, in the very complex events of the following decades and throughout all the 15th century, that um, balance that the great 14th century kings had managed to maintain with the, in their relations with the nobility came to be ever more deteriorated. Uh, the great personal charisma of the kings, the uh, individual gifts that had characterized certain 14th century experiences, so we have seen very powerful f characters like Casimir the Great of Charles IV, uh, are, if you want, the, the confirmation a posteriori uh, of, the, uh, of the decisiveness of, of, of the same. That is to say that without such strong personalities, the, the political institutional balance would have was definitely not in, in favor of the monarchy to itself perpetuate itself in a, in a ever more centralizing uh, direction. And in fact, it's not a coincidence that some, that only some great figures, such as um, uh, Matthias Huniadi, Matthias Corvinus, uh, in the Hungary of the 15th century, managed to intervene uh, to to momentarily, right, invert this tendency. But for still, you know, a, a broader situation could not be brought back. Right? It was fundamentally irreversible at that point. Um, so every every election otherwise was a negotiation or properly a back down. Right? The prince had continuously to renegotiate with the diets all the various prerogatives and, and rights. So even in the great diversity of the situations that surely existed in this sense, um, we see uh, this trend uh, in the same way, really, in, in Poland, Bohemia, and Hungary, because everywhere the representative assemblies were dominated by the nobility that spoke the language, the national language, uh, and and, exp and expressing through it a, a properly a national conscience um, that was sometimes counterposed to the to the extremity of the crown to the from from the tradition of the of the country and of the crown itself right uh, in bohemia all the great royal officials are elected in the 15th century by the diet right so basically everything the king wanted to do had to receive an approval uh, also in poland where the diet the the same the, the parliament was dominated by the schlachter by the nobility had to be uh, consulted and um, basically involved in all the great um, politically significant decisions. And it, at the beginning of the 16th century, the prerogatives of such assemblies, um, that is the, the result definitely of a long uh, evolution prepared by the local diets that are witnessed, witnessed since the 14th century, were further consolidated such as in the constitution Nihil Novi, uh, quite eloquent as a title, in 1505. Um, and uh, as it's been observed, uh, there was the irreversible and gradual passage from the, uh, let's say, the so-called democracy of the nobility to the oligarchy of the magnates, right? And initiatives like the ones of Matthias Corvinus that uh, introduced uh, in, in the 15th century Hungarian kingdom a permanent tax on the property being backed by the small nobility constitute nothing but a parenthesis. Basically, it is that, for example, the diet 
resumed its prerogatives. Mm -hmm. So there was not even anywhere like um, a uniform subjection of all the subjects to the king, right? Uh, the, there wasn't a passage from the sovereign to the monarch in these kingdoms. Um, this is important also considering properly the territorial dimension of certain realities. Think about Poland, right? Not Western Poland is basically Germany. Southeastern Poland is basically steppes or Russia or whatever you, you want to see it like. Think about Hungary, right? It's, uh, you know, you have an idea how many ethnic groups exist in there or how, uh, you know, it, properly the, the boundaries of, of, of the kingdom at the time. Right, uh, so and the different degrees of of power that necess that naturally were also territorially located, right? Uh, the 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 periphery was less obedient, obviously. So the the military mobilization remained strictly tied to the aristocracy, too. That in this sense dictated the game. Um, in Poland, the great aristocrats properly hired the lesser nobility right that as we've seen couldn't at that point be of much help for for the crown in this regard um there was the there was not the uh, an adequate development uh that had been outlined by the 14th century premises premises of um let's say uh, autonomous local administration from aristocracy and that could be directly uh, taking orders from the crown was the lack of the impulse to an ideological support to statal authority, right? Uh, albeit, there, there, there were some exceptions. For example, the, there is the Monumentum Pro Repubblice Ordinazione of the Polish um, Jan Osterok of the 20s of the 15th century. But um, a further and more punctual ref comparative reference to the evolution of, um, of the Western monarchies can't contribute to clarify in which measure these statements are, are a, a bit too peremptory. Because if you look, for example, at the French and English monarchy, right, uh, the, 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 the link between the complexity and, and, um, and f from the same richness of the relations of, of uh, feudal vassalatic dependency on the on the sovereign, so the bastard feudalism of the English and French historians, and that relations of patronage, of party, of factionalism, that tied the aristocracy to their monarchy, and, um, um, let's say, commit them in, in the, the administration. So on the contrary, in Hungary and in Poland, especially, in the 16th century and beyond, the same statal organization can be in its complex interpreted as uh, an instrument of consolidation and of tutelage to uh, of the aristocratic seigneury based on the uh, landed estates with the exercise of functions of justice of collection of the same statal um, taxes the patronate on the ecclesiastical institutions as well and more specifically on the serfdom that the aristocrats imposed to the peasant communities. Uh, this is particularly evident and particularly rigid in the Polish-Lithuanian state, where literally the nobility couldn't give a damn about the peasantry. And, and in Poland, for example, starting from the mid-15th century, the, the Latifundium was organized, in, introducing also the, the corvée on the seigneurial reserve, and in the 15th century, the pressure of the aristocracy over the, the peasantry grew um, and expressly was finalized um, to the growth and uh, in, uh, in the cereal production aimed at export, right? Uh, this is interesting because there are similar dynamics on another scale also in Western Europe, right? But here it's properly the nobility that controls them. In, in Europe it's Often the city that is taking over properly over the countryside and for the big international exports and never bending the passage. There it's properly uh, the nobility altogether as, as, as a territorial seigneury. That is much less healthy uh, 
for uh, for royal authority altogether. Um, there were a few revolts in all this, right? Uh, the, in, in the West, it was the 14th century, the great moment of revolts, of the jacquerie, of the repression of the salaried workers in the Flemish and the Italian uh, cities, right? Um, in, in, in Central Eastern Europe, the, the middle classes were too weak. There were a few revolts. Uh, in Hungary, uh, the, the pressure on the peasant classes um, actually favored the Turkish conquest because the peasantry at some point basically preferred the Ottoman rule, especially in the, the centralized position that Hungary got in some way that leaves still some you know room even for the still for the magnates though to to, to operate. Then then under properly you know the still the magnates, but when the kingdom was still ruled fundamentally by them on a, on a large scale because were dramatically oppressive. Um, so beyond the relation between monarchy and aristocracy, uh, there was an important involution of the institutional social reality due, uh, for example, in Hungary, such as in, in Bohemia and Poland, um, and uh, every context has its characteristics, but chiefly because of other structural elements that were somewhat progressed to, you know, to, as we've seen since much earlier centuries. Uh, we're talking specifically of urbanization, the the cities, the urban center, uh, the urban classes in general, um, because in spite uh, the um, the fourteenth century. Uh, demographic growth in, in Central Eastern Europe, there's a very important phenomenon, actually, while in the West it was mostly contracting the Black Death. In the 14th century, generally speaking, Central Eastern Europe kind of grew, right? But it was still complexively rather scarce, right? Uh, because these, these areas were being literally, you know, developed later. So even chronologically, the, these were, they has different rhythms of growth compared to, to Western Europe. That had already saturated and, and re shrank. Here they were still kind of growing, but still with fewer people. Um, per, per, per square kilometer, I mean, it, it was a very big difference, right? The, 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 the wide majority of European population at the time was in southwestern Europe. Here we are the opposite end. Um, so, the, um, so in, in the, the population was inferior globally taken, let's say, com complexly taken to uh, any of the great um, national areas in, in, uh, in continental Europe, like Spain, for example, or France, right? Um, and furthermore, the process of urbanization had remained rather weak, right? It was hinged especially uh, on a great number of, um, of centers of small consistency. Right, a, a very few Central Eastern European cities surpassed the eight thousand, ten thousand inhabitants. In in Poland, in the fourteenth century, for, for example, only Krakow, Breslau, uh, Danzig, and Stettin had more than two thousand inhabitants. Consider that the latter two were basically, uh, you know, coastal centers of the Hanseatic League. Um, the you know, the, it was of centers provided with um, a rather, s in general, a rather simple social articulation too, right? Also with a limited jurisdictional institutional autonomy. Uh, it had a scarce and intermittent political influence. Um, and it is true that since the 13th century, for example, in Bohemia, as we were saying before, royal power had supported energically actually and facilitated the development of cities and in, in some cases such as for example in Prague and in the mineral center of Kutna Hora the middle classes had manifested some political ambitions as we've seen the, recently in the video on the uh, Bohemian diet during uh, Hasidism uh, with some success indeed and um, the uh, most um, important of uh, the most you know, far-sighting and shrewd of the 14th century kings, such as Charles IV in Bohemia, that still 
distrusted corporations in general help. They, they still came from feudal dynasties, let's be honest. And Kazimierz the Great in, 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 uh, in Poland had favored the uh, urban development, framing also some um, city um, uh, noblemen, since, uh, yeah, in, in the magnate, in the royal counts, right? Besides funding uh, other cities, such as Lublin in Poland, and again, more in general, um, the the entire area from the Baltic to the Danube was altogether interest the, in during the course of the, the 14th century and also the 15th by a remarkable, uh, let's say, development of commer uh, of international trade. Right, uh, there was hinged not just on mineral production, but also on wood. Uh, force and textile product. This is true. But these traffics remained entrusted in good measure, at least for a certain time, to German and sometimes Jewish men and capitals. Right? And the, the substantial datum is that uh, the urban, let's say, the, 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 the incidence of the urban world was complexly scarce. Right, and, and this could not be modified. This is very important in, in insight. Right? These lands had, also before the Middle Ages, properly had never been urbanized before. Um, and, uh, and in general, in broader perspective, you, you also understand the reason why. Like just even, you know, even the climate is very important in this regard. And on, you know, pre industrial societies, you know, cold is an important uh, for, for agricultural production it's not really uh, the best thing and uh, these were historically less populated areas and um, there is so mm, less productive ones in, in general so we we could see uh, for example that starting from the mid 15th century certain prerogatives for example um, uh, of, of which for example the polish cities had enjoyed, such as, for example, the ratification of treatises um, signed by the king, or the, you know, um, you know, approval of royal election, were de facto eliminated, were, were, were nullified. Consider this, right? Th this is in a broader European perspective, right? It, it never think that the Middle Ages were a, a, play, a moment where people were were less, were more oppressed than the modern age, because this is not true historically, right? And this is what you can easily see from the end of the Middle Ages. So the progressive ideas of pos positivism, of progressism, the modern age, the great, this, there is n not much of that, right? Surely the system grew, but the rights of commoners proportionally were much reduced. So if we were to conclude this, um, uh, comparison well on the strictly institutional level the um, the profile of uh, central and eastern European monarchies and let's say the model of western monarchies definitely do and undebatably follow a uniform tendency that during the 14th century leads uh, for the internal dynamic of the kingdoms of Bohemia and Poland in particular, and by the action of, and government of certain kings, to even certain comparable outcomes. But under the surface of the institutions, reality is another thing. Right? If you look even just generally at the functioning, the concrete function of those institutions, that naturally takes into consideration the demographic, social, cultural uh, data and the um, economic productive mechanism show dramatically well the uncertainty and the contradictions of this tendency. Like, we cannot interpret this teleologically, of course, as a, um, a, a, a more, let's say, uh, a slower evolution towards a modern state. Because the experience of Central Eastern uh, European monarchies between the 14th and 15th century appears 
definitely something else. That process stopped, right? The, 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 the Western monarchies took off towards the dramatic development and centralization of the 16th and the 18th century. These monarchies basically stopped, in a sense, at the Middle Ages, stopped at private culture, at uh, oligarchic control, at the, 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 the weakness of central uh, authority. And this thing would, on the long run, fundamentally make them being taken over by, by other powers. Like, the history of these countries is basically Habsburgic Empire, Tsarist Russia, Ottoman Empire. And this thing stopped only in the 20th century. Right, so draw your conclusion in terms of what, with all the differences, because these were very different areas and it would remain very different, but fundamentally what happened to them in terms just of independence, right, and uh, with different degrees, indeed. Uh, the best happened under the Habsburgs, the worst under the Ottomans, definitely, uh, in, in, in insight. But also these powers had, uh, you know, properly expanded into pre-existing realities that had rendered those dominations possible in the first place, right? So that's my take on this. All right, so, yeah, I, I hope, I, I always like, uh, uh, every time I make this video, I say, you know, well, this is going to be like, they're going to throw tomatoes at me. <laughs> every time I, I, I speak, and there's, you know, brutal comparative terms, especially expressing, you know, conclusions that are very bitter, as you understand about the, the history of these countries. But objectively, um, this comparative perspective, long-term one, is, this is very well consolidated historiographically speaking. We know things happened like this, first of all. There's no way you can subvert it. But secondly, um, this thing is lacked. Like, if I talk often also with people from from many of these countries as well. And I realized, like, for for Western, for Europeans, or for, I don't know, North Americans, whatever, we don't know the history of our own countries. Like, it's useless to resort to identitarism, to ethno-nationalism, to communitarism, to all this bullshit. Even worse, even, you know, multiculturalism does the same. All equal, all flat. People do not know their own history. The average inhabitant of any country on earth, and definitely still in, in Europe, in, in, in you know, in, in, any, in the West broadly meant, which we naturally include these countries because they are historically still by any ma major standard, do not know their own history. There is nothing to do about this. School does not provide that. Not, not even university provides that. Not even university. Don't think that if you go to, to, to a university and you study history, you actually know the history of your own country. It's not like this anymore. It's probably never been like that, but probably today even less, right? This is an illness. This is an illness that the West is suffering at this point, right? The West cannot go on if it doesn't know its history, right? If you don't know your history, you properly are not even a person of your own country. You don't have a nationality. You're, you're, you're nothing, right? Your history is not uh, participating to a, to a football team kind of vision of history or identity or whatever. That is what the overwhelming majority also of the so-called conservatives uh, uh, would, you know, would like to pretend. Unfortunately, not. In order to know history, you have, first of all, to be an intelligent person, which most people really, by average... The, the average dignity of human standards are not. The same goes for the level of education. These things, you can't invent them. Like, you can't speculate on them. You have to learn them. And it's, it's that simple. And yet, I don't find this known. I don't find these essential. This is the ABC of European history. If you don't study this, if you don't acknowledge this, if you don't understand how this inf impacts us today, why certain things happen in the world altogether, they have happened, you cannot go anywhere. You're not a citizen. You're, you're, you're nothing. You're a subject. You see, it's the same story that we have seen here. There was the abortion of a civilization process. And there is no way around this. right? And you will not substitute it with color, with flags, with look. Nothing. That's pathetic. That's childish. right? So reflect on this. Because these things are important. 
there, there is a, a way, like you don't have to be an alt-righter or a leftist to make a point. If you are any of the two, you are nothing as an individual, right? There is a way to reconcile historical identity with national pride without being a moron, right? And most people don't even know where to start with that because the, the extremes are the wildest, beast-like, disgusting way to do it because every idiot is capable of doing it. And there is nothing proud to, about. There's no pride of that by any stretch of the imagination. So let's be honest about our history, about our past, about our identity, because that's the only thing that matters. Wishful thinking doesn't matter. All right, for now, we'll stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, please, uh, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.